Welcome back to our overview of strategic planning, week one, LDR 660. I'm John Wallace. We'll start again with Bryson's model, just again to get a look at his 10 steps. It is, of course, available for you to download within eCollege. When I originally created this PowerPoint presentation, it was for a class that was being taught in a blended format. So it was a little longer because we had three hours to work with at that point. Within strategic planning, you would need to form within the organization initial agreements. Whose plan is this? What are the purposes of the processes and the plan? What is given and what's possible? What do we clearly all understand? How will the process be tailored to fit the situation? How will the process be managed? How will the process be broken down into phases, steps, or tasks? And what schedule would be adopted? I have worked on strategic planning where after a month of emails and phone call conversations, I did a one-day strategic planning session with the board, and that was all they wanted. I have been involved in strategic planning processes that took two years and where we sometimes met twice a week for three months only to have a single paragraph on the mission or vision change as an end result. You, within class here, are going to create an initial agreement among the group for your group project that talks about how you're going to treat each other, how you're going to operate as a group, and how you're going to function and what tasks are going to be assigned. Again, an unfortunate reality of strategic planning from Dilbert. And I'll let you read that for yourself. After all, it's just the warranty in the chair. This slide has too many words on it for me. It doesn't fit presentations in, but it is actually from Dr. Bryson, so we're going to use it. Leading strategically, you must be aware of the tangible and the intangible, as well as understand the real value that comes from aligning purpose, mastery, and some autonomy within the entire organization across divisions, departments, and hierarchies. Edgar Schein, again, in organizational culture, talks about this, as well as many others. When we've completed a strategic planning process and even going through a strategic planning process, there are tangible, visible outcomes, including documented commitments to the work program, indicating the steps, procedures, contacts, and deliverables, stakeholder involvement in the process, data collection and analysis process and procedures, and procedural requirements and expectations. We're going to have written documentation and a lot of data. There is also in the content side, mission and vision, philosophy and values, goals, objectives and measures, strategies, action plans, budgets, and an evaluation process. We're not just throwing some plan out there. There has to be stepped measures along the way that we can see we're accomplishing what we need to or we'll need to make changes. But there are also some intangible and slightly invisible things that happen in the process of strategic planning. Stakeholders and relationships, including value positions, interests, and political and psychological needs, get met. We learn how to work together productively. We hopefully learn effective conflict management processes. The organizational culture, how we think about and do things around here, becomes clearer. Uncertainties about relationships, values, and the environment go away. And the requirements for achieving legitimacy, the value creation, get clarified. On a content side, there should be widespread appreciation of and commitment to the mission, vision, philosophy, strategies, and other key plan elements by the senior leadership, by major employer groups, and by other key stakeholders in the organization. And remember, we're going to continually talk about stakeholders, not stockholders. Bryson says a stakeholder is any person, group, or organization that can place a claim on the organization's attention, resources, or output, or is affected by that output. The research is clear, and if you're not paying attention to Daniel Pink, you should be, period, because understanding how powerful employee motivation and engagement is built upon a foundation of transactional trust is to creating the adaptability, sustainability, and profitability of our organizations is what will set you apart from your competition and create that true value. That doesn't mean that you don't have to learn how to operate within the confines of the existing organizational culture and guidelines, but since change starts with self, the only way our organizations change is first with us and then with those we lead. Roger Martin has quoted in Daniel Pink's Flip Manifesto, There is no clear data supporting the notion that making shareholder value maximization the objective of the firm actually does maximize shareholder value over the long term. In fact, whether you call it stockholder or shareholder value doesn't matter. Actually, the opposite is true. Less value is created. 
One of the tools that we're going to work with from Bryson is a stakeholder map. Here's a sample that's just blank that we'll fill out. You've got internal stakeholders within the organization and then external stakeholders. They're very helpful, the mapping tools that Bryson provides, and creates an easy-to-follow graphic as opposed to pages and pages of text. This one, uh, just a sample, potential government stakeholders, comes from Bryson himself. And within any sector of government, whether you're talking about state, local, or federal level, you have all these stakeholders around who have some input on what gets accomplished and doesn't. Maybe that's why the bureaucracy is so large. I know political comments here, though I guess you'd have to put the lobbyists in the interest groups section, and I would say they have too much influence. These are just some of the tools available for us to learn to use this semester, which doesn't mean you will have to use all of them. You may. That depends on the need of the organization and the KSAs that you already possess within your group. There's the basic stakeholder analysis, power and interest grids, stakeholder influence maps. I mean, stakeholders who don't have any influence aren't as important for us to work with. Bases of power, directions of interest, stakeholder position on issue or proposals versus stakeholder importance grids, stakeholder role plays combined. All of these specify how each stakeholder influences the organization so we can determine who has more influence or not. If they have heavy influence, we want them on our side and we want to make sure we understand their values and opinions. It helps us decide what the organization needs from each stakeholder and rank the stakeholders according to their importance in the organization. Power grid is just the same way. The broad crowd doesn't have that much interest or power within the organization, but there are key players who have heavy interest in the organization and a lot of power. Can't ignore them in any sense. Again, just because someone's identified as a stakeholder doesn't mean they have the power to affect the change necessary, and all of these categories, though, must be considered. Who's our opposition to the change going to be? We have strong supporters, we have weak opponents, and weak supporters. We need to understand who's going to oppose the change in the organization, and we need to understand who's going to support it so we can get them on our side and overcome the objections of the antagonists. You're in the middle of obtaining a graduate degree from Siena Heights University. Every one of your classes relates to strategic planning in some way. Every one of your classes relates to increasing your toolbox and your competencies, your KSAs that you will use to further your career, no matter which organization you're currently working for or if you're even working. So within your classes today in the Graduate Leadership Program, regardless of the specialty that you're in, I want you to think about how those classes relate to this. I and mean, we've talked about mission, vision, values, organizational design, organizational processes. There's a lot of different things that are going on here, and you should be able to pull from each of your previous classes to apply some of that knowledge into this class. This is not going to be our reality for this class. Alice, we have a new corporate policy, and I quote, Initiate the description of the criteria for requirements by developing a framework for the application architecture consistent with the planning corridor specified in our strategic initiative. Did you get all that? Wally, come here for a minute. Read this and tell me if she's doing any of it right now. You're going to work together. We're all going to work together. These are your assignments for week one. You're going to read Bryson's chapters one through three and resource A at the end of the book. There is the PennDOT case study that you're going to read and post some thoughts on, a couple of paragraphs, and then comment, of course, on your classmate postings. There is a discussion thread showing you Bryson's 10 steps, that map overall, and I just want you to look at it, and off the top of your head, each of you write a single paragraph about how professionals or amateurs would look at that map and what they might think of it. And of course, you need to comment, as always, on at least two of your classmate posts. You're to do a search online of strategic planning models, find one that fits for you, upload the model and the hyperlink where you found it, and then tell us why you picked the model, and please don't duplicate each other's work. Within either Group A work or Group B work is a brainstorming discussion thread, and you need to start having a discussion there about an organization that you might be able to do some work for. Now, all of you have relationships. In some cases, you'll have just completed, for instance, the research writing class, and you may have from that an organization that you could continue to do some work for. That's happened a number of times in this course. But by the end of this week, we need to have a pretty good idea of who you might, what organization you might be doing some strategic planning for. Whether, again, it's part of a subset of an existing strategic plan or a broader sense with an entire organization. 
You also need to begin working on an initial project agreement, not finalizing it, but just discussing how you're going to work together, how you're going to treat each other in this virtual environment so that we can make this a productive time where everyone improves their skills and their competencies. And combined, all of you are more effective than you would be individually. Because in real life, that's exactly the way it works in all of our organizations. Together, we are stronger, more viable, more innovative, more creative, and able to accomplish more as a team than individually. That's the end of the videos for week one. Thanks for paying attention. If you need something, call or email me and I will take care of it. Let's get busy.